So hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us today for our HashiCorp webinar. My name is Connor Beechnell, Senior Field Marketing Manager here at HashiCorp. And today I'm joined by Tim Ahrens, Senior Solutions Engineer, and Christoph Poole, Console Technology Specialist in the Field CTO Office here at HashiCorp, who today will be speaking about how to secure Kubernetes networking with Console Mesh and Envoy. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will send everyone a copy by email after it's been processed, usually within a day or two. We'll be presenting for about 40 minutes today and then we'll allow up to 20 minutes afterwards for questions. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A box provided and we'll answer those at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. As Connor mentioned, I'm a solution engineer with HashiCorp, and I will um, start the presentation today, talk a little bit about the history, why there is service mesh, how data centers evolved. And after this uh, quick journey, um, I will hand over to Christoph, and he will uh, talk about the more technical details and will give you a live demo as well. Um, so the road to service mesh. So basically when we look at our current way of deploying applications, um, we, in the last couple of decades, we moved from mainframes to virtual machines and are now in the space where we more, more of use containers and, and also serverless functions. Um, but there's like one common denominator and this is networking. And th this is actually, um, on the one hand, that's really awesome because, I mean, the serverless function is still able to talk to a mainframe using um, a network. On the other hand, um, the requirements changed dramatically. So if you look at um, a traditional data center, you had your parametric firewall, you might have some load balances, a couple of web servers, and those web servers need to talk to um, a database. Um, Traditionally, or you, you're still using probably um, firewalls to actually actually segment different um, zones in your network. So um, in, in this case, the web servers are only talk, are able to talk to the database because we actually um, set up um, firewall rules that allow the IP addresses of the um, web servers talk to the database. And this is what we do traditionally in data centers, like using the IP address as identity and also as a security measurement. So we only allow access based on IP addresses. If we move to a like more modern data center, we somehow open up our like on-premise data center. It's not a high trust network anymore. There's not only one parameter firewall that actually controls access from outside, but we start um, connecting different environments, for example, um, a public cloud and we might have Kubernetes running on the public cloud and we need to um, set up rules and services so like like pods in a Kubernetes deployment can actually talk to for example the on-prem database um, and this is where it gets tricky right because in, in Kubernetes an IP address has pretty much no meaning um, we use overlay networks we use all the different um, layers of networking with VPNs and stuff like this so setting up a firewall rule for, for specific deployment on Kubernetes to actually access our on-prem database is impossible. And what typically happens is that we start over-provisioning um, firewall rules. So instead of opening up a single IP address or single source IP address for a specific service, we open up uh, the whole Kubernetes cluster and allow it to talk to the on-prem database. So every instance, every pod that is scheduled, everything is able to talk to the local database. And um, this is something that, that needs to change because we don't want to open up like um, access for all services to our on-prem database. We want to be very specific and actually have like a service to service permission model. And, and, and this is required um, not only because our infrastructure is shifting, um, basically because we now have all the new deployment technologies like containers, like server, uh, serverless, we move away from like our monolithic applications um, to a more microservice um, oriented architecture. And in monolithic applications, certain things were just in there. So for example, if uh, in, in this example, if service A wants to talk to service B, or basically uh, function A wants to talk to function B, this is just an in-memory function call. 
there is no network hop. There is no requirement to actually find um, the service B on a network. But as soon as we move into the um, microservices architecture, um, connecting A to B is much more difficult because it's not just a function call. We somehow need to traverse the network because all of those different services like A, B, C, and D can run or typically run on different systems. And they might even run in different data centers um, across the globe. So um, we need to solve, uh, um, we need to find an, a way to actually do um, what uh, is typically called the service discovery. So we need to A, to be able to talk to B. And by default, you could say, okay, if you have an instance of A and an instance of B, you just hard code an IP address and, and that's it. But in a microservice architecture, you typically have multiple instances of a service, right? They scale up and down based on load, based on um, blue, blue green deployments or, or updates. And um, to solve for this in uh, traditional environments, and, and this could also be a three tier application, right? But it doesn't have to be a microservices architecture. You typically put load balancers in front of your different parts of your application. So in that, in that example, if A wants to talk to B, you do not hard code um, like an instance or um, something else. What you do is you basically hard code the IP address or the FQDN of the load balancer and the load balancer is doing um, the um, traffic distribution ac across the different instances. Um, this is just one example, but if A wants to talk to D to C and, and the other way around, you need a lot of load balancers to actually set this up. And, and in current enterprise environments, managing load balancers is a very manual ticket based process. And this is, there's no technical reason for this, right? So for example, we offer with Terraform full automation, same goes with console for load balancers. However, it's just not the way it is done um, today. And this, and, and as I also said, you need a lot of load balancers if you basically do this for each and every service in the architecture and, and in, a, in a microservice architecture, especially deployed on, for example, Kubernetes, this is not really um, feasible. For that reason, um, and to solve um, for um, this issue, we um, have our product console with, that is actually offering a couple of different um, functionalities. Um, we have obviously service configuration so that you have central service configuration, but you also have service discovery and service mesh. And from our point of view, service mesh is like um, the, the base requirement you need before you can actually um, start implementing a service mesh. And for that reason, let's have a quick look what service discovery actually is. So um, when we look at our application, again, we have A and B, instead of um, hard coding like a load balancer or putting a load balancer in front of um, B, uh, what actually is happening as soon as B, an instance of B starts like a service instance, application instance, and this could be a container, uh, but this could also be like VMs uh, and whatsoever, they register themselves in a central service registry. And, and in this case, this is obviously console. So they register themselves, they um, send the IP addresses, the, the data to the service registry, and now the service registry knows if, for example, application A, um, looks up um, application B, they will they know where it's running, so it will give um, application A an IP address. And you saw that we actually had a couple of IP addresses, so um, what console by default does is round robin across those different IP addresses. And most probably, this is how you actually configured your load balancers, right? Most load balancers actually do round robin instead of some load-based uh, load balancing. So this can pretty much replace um, a lot of load balancing instances, um, because as soon as application actually has the IP address, it can directly connect to service B. And it's important to understand that this, um, in, in the classical term of service discovery, is a direct connection. There's no tunneling yet and, and stuff like this. This is where service mesh later comes in. Um, the interesting part about this is that, obviously, we not just give out all the IP addresses of service instance B, um, but we only give out IP addresses that um, are actually available. So we do distributed health checking. We actually look if the node is available uh, and running, if the service is actually available. So you can do a lot of health checking. And only then um, the discovery actually gives you back an instance of B that is really available. And discovery can be done in, in, in different ways. One way would be to use the 
API of, of console. Another way would be to use our DNS interface, um, which makes it really easy to implement into existing environments and, and uh, without actually modifying any applications because you can just rely on um, DNS to actually do the discovery. So as I said, the connecting part here is just, is a direct connect, right? A is talking directly to B. And this is actually where service mesh comes in, um, at least from the segmentation uh, point of view. So if you again look at your traditional application that is deployed, you use firewalls to segment different zones, right? You might have your, um, your front end zone where the load balancer is um, located and your load balancer talks to your, um, to your monolith uh, and um, to actually allow this, you open up a fire rule that allows the IP address um, of the load balancer to talk to your application. Same goes for um, an external compo component, like for example, a database. Again, um, your web server segment and your database segment might be different um, zones. So you open up a, a firewall rule uh, in a static IP address. In this monolithic way, and even maybe in like a classical three-tier application, that's, that's fine. You, you can actually do it uh, even if it is there is a better way to do it. Um, however, um, with microservices, um, this looks different because with microservices, um, you not only have like the classical north, uh, uh, north south traffic where you actually come um, from externally and move in, but you have a lot of um, east west traffic, right? All the different services actually talk to each other. Um, and setting up fire rule, firewall rules for this is actually pretty complex. Um, because, I mean, as you can see, basically A is talking to B and C, D is talking to C, B to D. It's, it's really, there's a lot of patterns. And, and those patterns are actually also changing. As soon as a microservice, for example, gets updated, maybe uses a new a functionality from another microservices, you need to update those, right? The same goes for scaling. If you go up and down, there's a lot of um, configuration that needs to be done. And you can try to solve this using um, firewall rules or even maybe additional overlay networking, like for example, a customer is trying to solve this using VLANs or SDNs. Uh, but th this is, this is um, hard to actually find the correct rules. And it might be even possible to do this for like this for services, but as soon as we move into um, adoption of Kubernetes, like not only having like five or 10 um, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes containers or deployments, but maybe hundred, uh, hundred thousand or even 10,000 setting up IP rules and firewall rules and VLANs to actually allow them to communicate in a secure way or in a, um, to have actually some traffic rules in between is basically impossible. And this is where our service mesh actually comes in and, and or in general service meshes come in and can actually help you to, to solve this issue. And um, to tell you more about the technical details and how to solve this and also uh, finishing up with, with a demo, I'm handing it to you, Christoph. Thanks, Tim. Um, just let me share my screen real quick. We start over again where Tim left off. Um, so, as Tim already mentioned, um, a service mesh basically um, doesn't do enforcement on IP addresses anymore. Um, we're leveraging the underlying console service discovery to basically figure out where our upstream services are located. So just a quick overview how the console service mesh architecture looks like. Um, we have a clear distinction in console between the actual control plane um, which is basically the part doing all the calculations like um, bootstrapping proxy instances, registering services, um, generating CSRs, distributing certificates, and the underlying data plane. Um, one thing to mention here is basically that console really, first of all, doesn't care about the runtime it's on. So um, even though this today's cover, uh, webinar is around console on Kubernetes, we are not bound to Kubernetes only. Um, we can spin up a service mesh across various runtime and cloud environments, as you will see later on in the demo as well. Um, the data plane in console, um, which actually does all the packet pushing and, and all the authentication, authorization, and encryption features, this is built pluggable. Um, so first of all, we are shipping a small proxy agent within the console client agent. 
Um, we have first class integration with Envoy, as you will see later on. And we currently working on integrations with HA proxy and with other vendors as well. So basically customers of console service mesh can pick and choose which data plane they want to leverage underneath the console control plane. And also um, those will be like interoperable. So it's absolutely possible def depending on the features and um, the operating system, for instance, you're running on to have Envoy running on one end of the mesh and HA proxy running on the other side. Um, Tim already mentioned that we cannot rely on IP addresses anymore in dynamic environments or in container orchestrators like Kubernetes, as basically the IP addresses may change really quickly um, and operators are not able to catch up like with implementing firewall rules. This is why service meshes, not only console, um, leverage um, X509 certifi certificates to identify service endpoints and to also authorize service to service communication. Um, in the first place, this sounds like pretty complex because every single service endpoint needs to get its own certificate, which um, potentially should be short lived um, and it needs to be rotated, it needs to be revoked. Um, but this is all hidden behind the, the console control plane. So like from a high level point of view, it works like following as soon as you register a service with your console client agent, the client agent will generate all the needed key material and it will be signed by either an inbuilt console CA or you can also hook in an upstream CA um, like HashiCorp Vault, for instance. Um, you can also simply import like root certificates into the console CA. Um, as soon as this is done, the console client agent basically takes care of life cycling and bootstrapping the sidecar proxy instance. So um, when it comes to Envoy, this means that um, we offer the, the XDS API, which is needed for Envoy to fetch its dynamic configuration pieces within the console client agent. And through this interface, basically the console client agent will rotate the certificates if needed within Envoy, it will like install the certificate in the first place, obviously, and it will also configure things like layer seven routing we will see later on within Envoy during runtime on the fly. On a default basis, those certificates we're using in the console service mesh um, have a lifetime of 72 hours. You can go to as low as one hour currently if you, if you wanted to. Now that we don't leverage IP addresses being an identifier for a service anymore, we leverage those certificates. Um, we can basically build rules like which service can talk to which service, not based on IP addresses anymore. And we can do it with service names. And this is what we're calling the service access graph in console, which basically describes which service can talk to which other service. Um, Everybody who has seen a firewall interface before, this looks pretty familiar. Um, the only difference here is that you don't need to um, like reconfigure this if your service is down. So you don't need addresses, you don't need to remove IP addresses because all the service authentication authorization is basically done later on with the certificate which was like, offered for a given service. Um, those intentions, they also don't care about source IP addresses, destination IP addresses. They don't care if your service is running on Kubernetes or if it's running in your local data center on a bare metal server. From an application point of view to integrate in a service mesh, um, there are two main options. Um, first of all, in console, we offer a Go SDK so you can integrate your applications natively in the console service mesh. But the most common approach to integrate a application, um, especially when we're talking about out of the shelf software where you cannot touch the code um, into a service mesh is to leverage a sidecar proxy approach. Um, as mentioned earlier, those sidecar proxies, they are um, bootstrapped by the console client agent. They are life cycled by the console client agent and they will do all the heavy lifting um, on behalf of your application. So the only thing you really need to do is to tell your application that it can get all the benefits a 
service mesh offers by simply calling the sidecar proxy. And the sidecar proxy will then take care of um, traffic routing, service discovery, traffic encryption, um, endpoint authentication, and endpoint authorization. For Kubernetes, um, you don't really need to touch your deployments um, much. Um, we offer something called con uh, console auto injector, um, which respects uh, um, annotations within your deployments. And so you can like tell console you want to have a sidecar automatically injected, or you can tell console you don't want to have a sidecar injected. Um, but this is something I will show later on in the demo. So just to recap, how does this all work when we are basically going from bootstrapping to connecting our different services? Um, so first of all, those gray boxes um, where we see the application with the sidecar proxy and the console client agent, this could be anything. This could be a Kubernetes pod, this could be a bare metal server, this could be a virtual machine. Um, as soon as those services register themselves in console, the client agents will start retrieving the key, generating the key material, retrieving the certificates, um, bootstrapping the proxy, um, installing all the necessary knowledge, like where are my upstream endpoints, um, which certificates to trust um, within the sidecar proxy, and also the intentions I mentioned before, like which service can actually call the database service in, in this example here. And um, those intentions are getting distributed to the relevant console client agents, meaning that we don't have, when it comes to the authorization step later on, and um, we don't have a single callback instance where all the sidecar proxies need to call back and ask, am I allowed to take this connection? Yes or no. And we actually can do this in a distributed fashion within console just with a simple local host call. So after all the certificates are distributed, um, intentions are distributed, uh, the sidecar proxies are bootstrapped with all the service discovery knowledge. Um, when the web service wants to connect to the database in this example, it doesn't actually go um, call to call the database over the network by itself. It calls its sidecar proxy and the sidecar proxy is already pre-configured to know um, to which upstream service to connect. So it takes a load balancing decision connects to the sidecar proxy instance of the database and performs a mutual TLS handshake with the service certificate both proxies instances have. With this mutual TLS handshake, basically we offer authentication between the service endpoints. So the web service can rest assured it reached the database service and the database service knows which service just initiated the connection. After the handshake happened, we have an authenticated encrypted channel between the sidecar proxy instances. But at this point in time, there is no traffic flowing end to end yet. The next step after authentication and establishing this encrypted channel is basically the authorization step where the destination sidecar proxy will do an auth lookup um, against the local console client agent um, where it asks console basically, am I allowed to take this connection from the web service um, yes or no. Depending on the reply of the console client agent, either the session is reset if it doesn't, isn't allowed, or the traffic is flowing end to end through both um, for the application instances. In console, we offer service mesh for layer four and for layer seven services. So for traditional layer four applications like MySQL databases, for instance, or something else, you name it. Um, basically, when you call a service, console will make sure it will route you to a healthy endpoint to you to the integrated health checks. It will load balance your traffic between the available endpoints. It will authenticate, authorize, and encrypt the channel between your service endpoints. This is true for everything we are transporting, which is layer four TCP traffic. As soon as it comes to layer seven traffic, so HTTP or gRPC traffic, um, console offers a complete traffic management chain um, to give you like value added features on top of what console offers. Um, this is currently only available with Envoy um, and we offer like a complete chain with HTTP routing, traffic splitting and custom resolution. Um, so HTTP routing basically can reroute layer seven traffic based on um, 
the API path you're calling based on the HTTP verb you're using or based on HTTP headers. Um, traffic splitting is mostly used for canary deploys, so where you have like multiple versions of a service and you want to test a new version and send parts of the traffic to your new version. And then we have a feature called custom resolution, which is like mostly used in conjunction with traffic splitting, um, where you instruct console, what does it mean if I have a new version? How can I identify these new endpoints? Um, we will see all of this in the demo later on. So I'm not going to, to dig deep into it. We just recently announced the 1.8 beta release of console um, where we are shipping some new gateway functionalities. Um, so I'm starting from left to right here. And um, one of the current beta features is ingress gateways. Um, ingress gateways basically offers a well-defined entry point into the service mesh completely controlled by console. Um, this is pretty helpful if an external service wants to call a service which resides into the mesh. So um, you can simply point your service to an ingress gateway and the ingress gateway will then um, figure out how many service instances are available in the mesh. Um, it will res uh, restrict your traffic, it will authenticate and authorize your traffic. A feature we have for a little bit over a year now is mesh gateways, which basically makes it easy to connect various cloud environments through, I would call it kind of an aggregator for your service mesh traffic. So with mesh gateways, you don't need to open up your firewalls in any to any fashion. You can really tunnel all your service mesh traffic to a well-known point-to-point -point connection or point-to-multipoint connection. Um, the thing that we are released in console 1.8 is that you will also be able to like, federate your console data centers through mesh gateways. Um, and then we have terminating gateways, which is also a beta feature currently, um, where terminating gateways are able to impersonate an external type of service within the service mesh. And so think of something where you're not able to integrate directly in the service mesh, like a managed database in a cloud environment or like a mainframe instance sitting in your local data center. So a terminating gateway can basically impersonate this instance within the service mesh and you can then do all the authentication and traffic restrictions you have for native service mesh endpoints um, with this endpoint as well. Coming back to the mesh gateway, um, which is, in my personal opinion, one of the, the most helpful features we currently have in console service mesh, as it solves like a variety of problems. Beside the aforementioned interconnection of various cloud environments, um, we see many customers um, trying to set up multiple Kubernetes clusters. So there's a vast majority of service meshes which are working pretty, pretty solid within one single Kubernetes cluster. But as soon as you need to interconnect multiple Kubernetes cluster, as soon as you need to interconnect um, various runtimes like Kubernetes and virtual machines, um, this can get pretty tricky. And the mesh gateway feature in console basically enables you to interconnect um, various Kubernetes clusters, various runtimes, various clouds, and it really doesn't care about IP addressing anymore. So as you will see later in, in the demo, even though somebody might have configured its Kubernetes clusters as crappy as I did, um, with the same exact IP address ranges, we can still like interconnect those. Um, when I'm talking about interconnection here, one thing which is pretty important in my personal opinion, um, the mesh gateways itself, they are not performing any man-in-the-middle attack. They are not equipped with service certificates. So um, those are just SNI routers. So they're routing traffic based on TLS headers and they are not encrypting the TLS payload. Um, oh, sorry, my daughter just came in. Um, where did I stop? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so those things, um, they still accept the end-to-end the -end encryption and authentication um, within console service mesh, even though they are like in the middle of the traffic flow. When it comes to Kubernetes integration of console, um, we have like, I would say first-class integration 
with Kubernetes. And console is one of our tools, which has basically, in my opinion, the most solid integration into Kubernetes. Um, first of all, we offer a Helm chart for console, which makes it easy to really bootstrap all of the aforementioned things within a Kubernetes cluster. Um, besides of the service mesh features I'm showing you later on, we also offer like basic service discovery features when it comes to Kubernetes, where you can um, sync the services between multiple Kubernetes clusters um, if you're not yet there to work with um, service mesh. And we can help you like to do multi-cluster service discovery as well by means of a shared console cluster. Um, with a console ham chart, you can bootstrap everything like the console connect auto inject feature, um, which is a mutating webhook and listens to your deployment. You can run it in two modes basically to inject the proxy sidecar instance for every deployment or to only inject the proxy sidecar instance if you add this annotation to your deployments I showed you earlier. We can bootstrap the mesh gateway um, to basically make it pretty easy to interconnect multiple Kubernetes clusters by just exposing one external IP address through a layer four load balancer. And with that, I'm coming to the demo. Um, I'm not sure if we already have questions in the chat. I don't see it, but Connor, you can jump in if this is the case. So um, my demo environment currently looks as follows. I have two Kubernetes clusters, one in GCP Europe, one in GCP US, um, and I have a virtual machine environment based on AWS. You can think of this AWS based environment like your on-premise data center where you have your virtual machines running and your, your legacy applications and with all your system of records are basically located and um, that you don't wanna distribute to the cloud, but still you wanna make cloud instances um, able to consume those data which is residing there. Um, those are three separate console data centers, as we call it, but with a console federation, um, with a console WAN federation. Basically, I federated those, I interconnected those beforehand with the mesh gateways, um, which you can see here, those, those little locks. And um, so I have a single point of management for all of my features. I have a single point of visibility. So just real quick, where is it? Here we go, um, giving an overview of the demo environment. So as mentioned, um, I have these three data centers. This is the console UI for all of you who haven't seen it. Um, this is my AWS based data center, which is made up of six virtual machines. Mm -hmm. And I have like only three main services running in this data center. I have the console service itself. I have my mesh gateway running for interconnection purposes. And I have something I'm calling my web backend. So I'm, I'm not an application developer. So my application is really pretty basic. Um, and I have my, my two Kubernetes-based data centers. In my Kubernetes-based data centers, um, there's nothing running it yet. There's only the console service itself and my mesh gateways for interconnection purposes. Same here in my US-based data center. If I check what's, what kind of pods are running in my Kubernetes clusters, um, they're looking pretty much the same. Um, first of all, I have a console server running, um, which is running as a pod on top of Kubernetes itself. So this server um, in production environments, you would have like, like three or five of those guys. Um, those things here with a pretty pretty cryptic name, those are the console client agents. And when it comes to Kubernetes, the console client agents, which offer the uh, console API to Kubernetes workloads, they are running as a daemon set. So I have one daemon set running per Kubernetes node um, within my cluster here. I have the mesh gateway functionality, um, which is running as a pod as well. So the mesh gateway is based on Envoy as well, it's just differently configured and bootstrapped than a sidecar proxy instance. And I have my, my auto inject feature. I'm running it in a default inject mode so that each and every deployment I'm, I'm deploying will get a sidecar. All right, um, I just mentioned that my Kubernetes clusters are pretty, pretty correctly configured. Um, if you, if I check my, my side arranges I'm using for the pod overlays, and um, those are basically the exact same um, across both of my Kubernetes clusters. Um, nevertheless, I will later on be able to interconnect pods from those 
clusters um, while maintaining end-to-end -end encryption. All right, um, now I want to basically configure a service on top of Kubernetes and wanna have this service to call back to my, my virtual machines in my data center. Um, this front end service, I'm gonna deploy in a, in a second on my Kubernetes cluster. I'm gonna show you the um, pod spec first of all. So it's really not much, it's just an HA proxy container which um, declares that it wants to connect back as an upstream service to the, the backend service, again, through an annotation which gets respected by console. Um, that's everything I configured. So this web back, uh, backend application, as you, as you see, is not available locally. And um, so through the console federation, console will basically figure out where to find this service. And um, it will reconfigure the sidecar proxy First of all, it will auto inject the sidecar proxy. It will configure it in a way um, to leverage the mesh gateway to call back to my AWS virtual machine based environment. All right, um, one thing to note here, I only define one application container, right? And um, we can see no init containers, just one HA proxy container. If I'm going to, to run this, and I'm fast enough, I, I was fast enough. So you see down here, even though I only, uh, let me pull it up a little bit, this guy here, even though I only configured one application container, um, Kubernetes is about to run one init container and to start three application containers. And the reason behind this is um, the console auto inject feature. If we look at the pod, how it actually looks like, um, or basically what happened there or what runs is, first of all, um, there was an init con container injected by console and this first init container is console itself. So this init container takes care of registering the service within console first of all. So if I now check my data center here, um, you can see that I now have this front end service running as well um, with the respective sidecar. Besides registering the service in console in the first place, um, this init container will also generate a bootstrap configuration for Envoy. Uh, and this bootstrap configuration basically points Envoy to the uh, XDS API of the daemon set. Um, it's not much more than this. From an application container point of view, I have my HA proxy container running, which I defined. Um, I have a so-called lifecycle container, which is the, the console Kubernetes integration. And this guy takes care of the um, service registry and lifecycling the application. So making sure that the service is um, still registered within um, the console service catalog. And I missed my N1 container, which is basically here. And um, so we are leveraging a vanilla Envoy, um, setting this up as a sidecar for my application container. And this grabs the um, bootstrap configuration, which was created by the init container, connects itself to the console client daemon set and gets completely configured. So if I now hit this application here, um, the application will basically reply back. So this IP address you can see here, um, just to tell you, show you I'm not cheating, <laughs> is my layer four load balancer on front of my Kubernetes cluster. It's not going directly to my AWS environment. Um, nevertheless, um, as you can see, I'm hitting my Kubernetes front end. Um, the console service mesh brings me back to my backend virtual machine running on AWS. And even though I'm working across two cloud environments, two runtime environments, you will see that um, the IP address should change from time to time. So I'm also getting the console integrated load balancing. Um, this backend application on top of those blue machines here has also a, a path called slash API, um, which is also served from there. This is the red window. What I want to do now, basically, I want to deconstruct like my monolithic application, as Tim mentioned earlier, and to put it into microservices. This slash API path, I want to carve it out. I want to make it more um, dynamic and putting it onto Kubernetes. Um, for this, I'm gonna deploy 
this application real quick on top of Kubernetes, my little API service. You will see as soon as the init containers were running or did run, um, the service registration already happens here and the health check, as soon as they get green, I'm basically able to interconnect um, to this as well. So also here, um, nothing special. Um, I didn't declare anything like sidecar containers, and this is just an Nginx container rendering a web page. Um, what I did, I added some metadata, which is respected by console declaring this version one. So now I want to um, like integrate this in my overall application, like as soon as my client from outside calls the slash API endpoint against my front end, I want to make sure it's routed to my API containers and not to my virtual machines anymore. Um, for this, I obviously have obviously have two, uh, two options how to do it. I could completely rewrite my front-end application, um, instructing it where to find my API path endpoint. Um, but what I want to do, I want to instruct the service mesh. So I don't want to reconfigure my front-end. Um, I'm going to le leverage console slayer 7 traffic management functionality for this with an HTTP router. Basically, this is a pretty simple router, um, as, which as soon as somebody wants to reach the web backend but matches another API path, which is called API here, um, the traffic will get rerouted to my API service, no matter where it's run. So um, a pretty nice thing within console is basically the visualization of how traffic is treated um, in the current point of time. So currently we're seeing that for the web backend service, like every API path is routed to my web backend service instances, um, depending on where they reside. So this is the view from the AWS data center. Um, and I can see I have uh, some failover data centers configured, which are my Kubernetes based data centers. So it doesn't really matter where I spin up a service console will figure out what's the, the best service for me personally to use. So um, let me just quickly introduce this service router, um, which should make sure that when I hit the API endpoint, I'm going to be routed to this red endpoints. So we are expecting something to happen in the red window here um, as soon as I configure the service router. So my service router, I put it in a quick bash script, and you will see something happening in the console UI. Basically, we will see the router in nearly real time there. And we should also in really near time see something happening in the right window. Okay, perfect. Now, two things happened. First of all, the router got installed. We see that um, the slash API endpoint gets now routed to my API service, not to the web backend service anymore. Um, but it doesn't really look good. So I missed something obviously. And this is kind of on purpose for sure during a demo. And um, what I wanted to show you is like how console intentions are working. Because console intentions are building an end-to-end authentication and authorization and um, like trust. And now my web front end is routed to the API service and the API service notices that the front end service tries to establish a connection. But what I didn't configure um, is the respective console intention. So my front end service currently is only allowed to talk to my back end service. Nothing else is allowed in my console data center. Um, so I need to configure this intention. Um, I'm creating the intention for my, my web front end service for my API service. I'm currently connected with my CLI to the AWS based data center. Um, but those intentions, they are getting replicated across all of my federated console data center. So I have a single point of management um, for all of my intentions. Um, as soon as I like hit return here, you will see the intention show up in my UI as well. And then like the connection end to end should be allowed as well. And you can see it changed pretty quickly. Um, now my classical traffic, like hitting any API path is routed from Kubernetes to my AWS based data center, while this little microservice I just deployed um, is being leveraged for this specific path. Right, let's get back to my, my service and check the routing here. So now that this application like was working for two minutes, pretty good, um, I'm gonna declare it version one and I, for whatever reason, 
want to implement a version two of my service. I don't, this is currently running on a different cluster, different team develop it, different cloud environment. Um, it doesn't really matter why. Um, so I'm going to deploy this version two of my API service here on my other Kubernetes cluster. Um, what you can see right away is basically the same steps happening, like injection of the sidecar service registration. Um, but between my two Kubernetes clusters, um, this is the European one, which hosts the version one. The service is called API. And in the US one, which I just deployed, the service is called API as well. The only difference between my two deployment specs is basically the service metadata I attach to the service. And um, so this is something which console can leverage to decide if it's version one or version two. Um, so what I now want to do, I want to like test this new version, but I don't want to shift all traffic right away to this new version. Um, I want to instruct the service mesh to like send the majority of my traffic to my old version while sending some percentage of my traffic to the new version of the traffic um, to test it and to see how it behaves. For this, I'm using a traffic splittering console, um, which I'm going to configure with 7030 in this case, even though the slide said 8020, um, which instructs console that every request for the API service should like get split it in a 70-30% manner between the service subset version one and version two. Um, the metadata actually is used within a service resolver which instructs console and um, what does it mean version one subset and version two and therefore I'm um, using the attached metadata to make this decision. Right, let's quickly install this but first of all have a check here like for my web backend, which I'm originally calling. And I'm installing the service splitter. And you will see the splitter hitting in here. Um, you will see that the splitter is only for the API service and it's splitting in a, we should see some numbers here. Oh, there it was, uh, 30, 70, 30% manner. And you will also see the endpoints toggling here between my, my version one service and on my local cluster and the version two service on my remote cluster. You can see it right now. While my traditional traffic hitting anything else than the slash API path, this will like call back into my on-premise in my classical environment into AWS and um, whatever. Um, so, and with this, I'm basically at the end of my demo. Um, I hope it like give you at least a quick overview of how easy it is with console to interconnect multiple runtimes, multiple cloud environments, while still maintaining this single point of, of management, the single point of trust and the end to end um, encryption and enforcement that console offers. And with that, um, thank you for joining and we are open for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Christoph and Tim. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come through. I'll start from the top. Christoph, a question for you first. How do we get audit trails and logging information when using a sidecar proxy? Um, audit trails and logging information. Um, so we are able to centrally configure um, Envoy like where to send its statistics to where to send its metrics to. And we currently don't have this built into console as there are so many great tools out there like, like Prometheus, like Datadog, where you can basically collect all of these things and many of our customers already have those in place. Um, but we give you the ability to, to easily um, configure those statistics and metrics endpoints across of the, the fleet of your console, um, of your Envoy Sidecar proxies. Hope this answers the question. Okay, fantastic. Another one is, from what we've spoken about today, how is this different from GCP and FOSS? I think that's a very good question. However, I at least don't have the answer. I haven't looked into much detail into GCP and FOSS, so this is something that we have to look afterwards. So if there is interest around this, um, just hit us up 
um, at hello at hashicorp.com or uh, send Christoph or myself an email and we can uh, have a detailed chat around this. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely take that one offline. Thanks, Tim. So, Tim, sticking with you now, a question, can console be used with OpenShift? Oh, yeah, I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, OpenShift is pretty similar to Kubernetes and, and we officially support it. So um, you can use it um, any way you like. And um, I think the latest hand chart is even compatible with the um, current um, OpenShift releases. Uh, Christoph, uh, I hope that that's correct, right? Not 100% sure, but we're working at least pretty um, pretty closely with the Red Hat guys to, to get yeah. like even better integration than just the Helm chart. Correct. So it is supported and it's working, um, but we're always trying to give um, our customers a better out-of-the-box experience, I would say, right? So for example, maybe having an operator which is currently not available. Okay, fantastic. And then the last question that we've had come through is, is there a way of integrating external services like SaaS apps? Christoph, this one is for you, I guess. Um, it, it depends on like what the SaaS application is. Like um, integrating Office 365 will be pretty hard, but um, integrating like a managed database, um, you can leverage those new gateway functionalities we, we just released um, to, I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent perfect integration, but it's a good starting point where you have these terminating gateways um, which can impersonate those external services within the service mesh. Okay, fantastic. Well, Tim, Christoph, thank you very much for this great presentation today. And thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out today. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make that recording available on our website after it's been processed. And I'll send you a link, uh, usually within one or two days to that recording. Also, if you liked what you heard today and you want to start exploring console, I encourage you to check out our new Learn site. And you can find that at learn.hashicorp.com forward slash console. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.